live online for Wednesday, February 17th, 2021. Uh, my name is Drew Clark. I'm editor and publisher of Broadband Breakfast. Very happy to welcome you to another episode. This, uh, uh, today we're gonna be talking uh, about rural broadband. And this is the fifth of a five part series that we've had called Tools for Broadband Deployment. Uh, this one, fueling the fire of rural innovation. And so we're, we're really going to talk broadly, uh, but we'll also talk specifically, too, about aspects of rural broadband deployments. And before I go any further, I want to thank our sponsors for this series, Render Networks, which has a digital system for ensuring rapid broadband deployments, and Adtran, which is very focused on the rural marketplace and uh, this series would not have been possible without Adtran and Render Networks. And also again, before I turn it over to our three great panelists, I want to recap, um, if you will, the highlights of this five-part series we've been on. We started last October, about four months ago, talking about uh, how there were multiple initiatives for getting better broadband for rural America out there. How can entities that are seeking to serve them prepare for that, prepare for success, if you will, you know, begin with the end in mind. Um, and then we moved on in November to talking about the way to connect providers and customers faster through an all digital workflow uh, and, and focused again uh, on fiber building and how they had success in construction management and workflow systems. Uh, December, later in, in December, or I should say in December, we talked about um, the way that uh, financial uh, projections and um, plannings plan and planning figured into rural deployments. Uh, again, you know, not exclusively for rural digital opportunity fund uh, uh, bidders. At that time, the, the auction was was just wrapping up in late December, and now the the, the documents are have all been submitted. So we're we're kind of entering an action phase now here in February. But back in December, we talked a lot about the financial aspect there. And then um, earlier this month, February 3rd, we had our fourth series. It was on mapping and the important role of GIS systems and uh, data analysis in both the current, I would say, and future, ep future efforts to push for rural broadband. Because the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund reverse auction that took place last year was just the first part. There will be other phases. And, and we can't forget that there are projects out there besides RDOF, such as Connect America Fund and um, Reconnect program of the US Department of Agriculture, as well as completely private or state funded efforts. And, and I'm sure all three of our guests will talk a little bit about some different aspects of that as well today. So with that, a recap, I want to um, uh, uh, lead in now to our guests and, and a reminder that even though this series is, is, is uh, the fifth of five today, we, we continue with Broadband Breakfast Live Online every Wednesday at 12 noon. I'll tell you more about our programs for the next two weeks at the end of this, this show. So without any further ado, let me kind of open it up to all of our guests whom we're very excited to have. Uh, Mark DeFalco is the Telecommunications Initiative Manager for the Appalachian Regional Commission. You may go, Appalachian Regional Commission, what do they have to do with broadband? Well, Mark is going to tell us, and they do quite a bit on broadband and telecommunications, and we look forward to hearing from him just now. He'll be followed by Dr. Christopher Ali. He is Assistant Professor of Media Studies at the University of Virginia. Uh, I've been pleased to uh, interact and have Chris on panels that, that I've uh, put together for Broadband Breakfast and for the Rural Telecommunications Congress. Uh, and he is coming out with a very exciting book on farm fresh broadband in September of this year. So I'm sure he'll mention that in, in his, his remarks too. He can really uh, give a very comprehensive view of rural broadband, rural broadband issues. Uh, again, batting cleanup will be Brian O'Hara, who is the uh, Senior Director for Regulatory Issues for National uh, Rural Electric Cooperative Association. I hope I didn't mangle that, Brian, but, but Enrica is a very, very key player in all aspects of the rural economy, um, but particularly broadband. And, you know, we were so excited 
that we uh, were, were uh, looking forward to having uh, Enrica with us, the, our first event. You know, we actually had it all lined up and we're ready and gearing to go to, to have um, Jim Matheson of the CEO with us. But we had some technical difficulties because of a prior platform we used. Hopefully we sorted those out. Very happy, Brian, that you can join us. Tell us about Enrica, your role in this, this sector of the economy and particularly with Ardoff and how important a role it's playing right now. So with that, let's go ahead and turn it over to you. Uh, Mark, tell us a little bit about Appalachian Regional uh, Commission and um, how you are um, uh, working with broadband. Thank you, uh, Drew. It's a pleasure to be here and thanks for the invite to be on here. Um, We've been in the broadband business really for about 20, 20 some years. And, uh, you know, when you look at Appalachia, we're uh, very much like rural America all over the country. And when you look historically at really what happened and, you know, the, the, the progress of broadband through the, through the years and through the different iterations of technology, I mean, it really started with DSL service that was being offered by the telephone companies and uh, you know, very low grade service. Um, especially by today's standards, although back then, uh, you know, it was pretty good, um, better than dial-up anyhow. Um, and, and then for the lucky people who were in a cable footprint, that made a, a, a tremendous difference when the cable really started getting into the broadband business. Um, the speeds from the cable systems were much better than what you were able to get out of the DSL. Uh, the problem in rural areas, though, is that the cable systems you know, tended to congregate around the nucleus of the smaller towns. And, uh, you know, if you lived in the downtown area um, or a mile or two out of the downtown area, you probably were in the cable footprint. But if you got two, three, four miles out of downtown, then uh, you were outside of the cable footprint. And once you got outside of the cable footprint, then you were reliant on the DSL service. And the DSL service, um, you know, historically, was only going out maybe three miles from the uh, uh, central office, which also was located in the downtown area. So, you know, the more rural you became, the more outside of those nucleus centers of the uh, small towns, um, the greater the chance was that you did not have broadband and you were stuck with dial-up. So as we went through um, time, you know, things changed. Uh, the telephone companies through various subsidy mechanisms and other means um, we're able to extend fiber further out into the network uh, and, and create their uh, D slams or you know, platforms that was really where the fiber connected to the copper. Uh, that was migrating outward, kind of like a hub and spoke uh, of a wheel kind of a thing. If you think of the hub being the nucleus of the downtown area and then the spokes going out, um, but it was still very much constrained by the distance from the uh, uh, fiber connect point. And of course the cable systems were upgrading too to the different um, uh, technologies through their DOCSIS three upgrades. But once again, uh, you had to be within their footprint. Um, so then wireless came in, um, uh, fixed wireless, uh, microwave radios, uh, very good um, for rural situations where you didn't have a lot of density. Um, problems with the wireless really was uh, you had to be somewhat close to the transmitters, and more importantly, you had to have direct line of sight. Um, so you, your house or your business had to have direct line of sight to that radio on the tower, uh, otherwise it didn't work. And of course, when you get into Appalachia, um, we have a lot of hills and we have a lot of forests, and uh, that created a lot of problems too. So you had some other iterations of wireless, like the um, new uh, white space wireless systems, um, which also helped. And of course, now you have satellites. Um, but um, best thing, of course, is fiber. And, uh, you know, it's, that, that's going to give you the highest bandwidth. So um, we're a funding agency and uh, things are really changing. They're, they're changing for a lot of reasons. I mean, the federal government is starting to throw a lot of money at broadband uh, through the RDOF program that uh, Drew mentioned. Um, the reconnect program coming from the rural utility service at USDA. And uh, there's a new program that's going to be coming online fairly soon. Um, NTIA has a $300 million program for broadband that will be coming online um, uh, shortly. Uh, but then you have other uh, smaller uh, groups like ARC, 
Delta Regional Authority, um, Northern Borders uh, that have been doing broadband all along and you know, putting money into infrastructure. We do it all. We've done fiber. We've done a lot of wireless because, again, we're in very rural areas where you know, the fiber takes a, 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 lot to, uh, a lot of money to put in place. Um, we're extremely thrilled right now with the prospect of working more with the uh, rural electric cooperatives because that really is making a, it's a game changer for rural America. So very interested to hear from Brian, what he has to say, and uh, just thrilled to be part of the panel. And uh, as we get into the discussion, we'll talk more about what ARC has been doing and what we intend to do going down the road. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mark, for that uh, good summary of the role. And uh, we'll ask more questions as, as we, we go into it, but um, uh, really do appreciate you highlighting uh, the, the additional initiative of the um, emergency broadband benefit that is was part of the uh, kind of the, the final, well, whatever, the most recent stimulus uh, uh, measure and, and three billion that is being kind of decided how it will be implemented by the FCC as we speak. So uh, good, good to tee that up too, but I neglected to mention that. Uh, Professor Lee, let's turn it over to you now. Yeah, uh, thanks, Drew. It's, it's, it's great to be here. I'm a big fan of Broadband Breakfast. Um, for those of you who don't know me, Christopher Alley, um, Associate Professor in Media Studies, and I've been writing and researching about rural broadband for the last five years. Um, kind of the hallmark of a lot of my research was this rural broadband road trip I took um, in summer of 2018 uh, with my hound dog, Tuna. We drove almost 4,000 miles across the Midwest. Um, talking to, you know, kind of anyone who would talk to us about, about rural broadband and the challenges and opportunities therein. Um, so a couple of things, you know, that really emerged from my research, um, and I know uh, Brian's going to talk more about the importance of, of electric cooperatives, but, you know, in my work, cooperatives um, end, end up being the, the kind of the unsung heroes of, of rural broadband. They are the ones who are uh, deploying fiber to the home, particularly in, the, in these most rural communities that um, Mark talked about. So, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're emerging as, as a distinctly kind of lo uh, local ethos. They've got, they've got a commitment to their communities. They understand that an investment in broadband it, it can't be measured in kind of the quarterly return on investments that you might see some of the national providers uh, demand, right? But instead, it's an investment in their communities. And I think one of the really cool things about cooperatives as well is that we can see these people at the grocery store. I mean, there is that kind of local accountability. We know who they are. We might even have their phone numbers. They might be our neighbors. Um, so just to me, uh, uh, particularly for a lot of these rural communities, it, it adds that kind of accountability um, and presence that we're not seeing from the, from the larger providers. And especially as we know that, you know, um, providers like at and are, are rolling back or, or pausing um, their, their DSL, rural DSL networks. A um, couple of things I think we should be on the lookout for, of course, I know uh, we're all thinking what's going on with fixed wireless uh, providers and RDOF. Um, they came out of it with a huge victory. Um, like Mark said, uh, fixed wireless can be really beneficial for um, rural communities because it, uh, it is not as expensive as fiber to the home and it can cover a large area. It's particularly important, as we know, for agricultural communities that precision agriculture is going to depend on fixed wireless networks. Um, but whether or not some of these fixed wireless providers can live up to their promises um, that they made in RDOF with gigabit speeds is something that we're all going to have to be uh, watching very closely um, and, and looking for accountability uh, when accountability is due. Um, something that's also particularly interesting here in Virginia, I'm in, I'm in Charlottesville, Virginia, but there's a really interesting lawsuit going on right now as to whether electric cooperatives are able to string fiber on utility poles that sit on private property. Um, this is a case involving the, the Rappahannock Electric Cooperative. Um, and it actually, the, the, the existence of the lawsuit forced Rappahannock Electric Cooperative to completely pause and reconsider its planned fiber uh, to the home plan. Um, and, and so I am, I'm, I'm watching this lawsuit really carefully. Um, it just came to my attention a few weeks ago. Uh, and, and Virginia has been a state uh, that has kind of struggled a little bit, uh, you know, if we compare to 
um, kind of big money states like Illinois and New York in terms of broadband grants um, and more kind of comprehensive broadband offices like in Minnesota. And I am a little bit worried that this, this lawsuit might kind of take the legs out from under the, the kind of amazing work that's been happening here in Virginia. Again, thanks in large part to the electric cooperatives um, for those of you who know what Firefly Broadband is, the Central Virginia Electric Cooperative, they've been doing incredible work in rural communities across the state. So I think this lawsuit is definitely something we're going to be um, on the lookout for. Uh, you know, and already we know that RDOF has kind of taken the legs out of a lot of state programs as well. So, um, I, you know, I'm bullish on states and the role that states can play in rural broadband planning policy deployment. Um, and I'm, I'm really hoping we're not going to see kind of a giant halt here in Virginia um, uh, because of this lawsuit and, and again, because of some of the stipulations within RDOF. Uh, Chris, let me just ask you to reply or, or elaborate a little bit on this key point you just made, which has a, a concerning ring to it. You said RDOF has really taken the legs off of state broadband programs. Could you just elaborate a little bit on that? Why and how can that be rectified now if there's different policy priorities uh, from the Biden administration versus the Trump administration? Right, well, I, I'm, I'm particularly thinking about the provision with an RDOF that said that if, if um, a provider has uh, had state funding, it is no longer eligible for RDOF for FCC USF support in those particular regions. Um, and, and to me, this doesn't make sense because why wouldn't we want providers uh, to, to search out for all pockets of money, right? We should not force providers to decide between state funding and RDOF funding when there's, I mean, we're talking about big money here. And if we're talking about this kind of money, Illinois is 420 million. I just learned that Iowa is, you know, devoted something like 450 million over three years, New York, $500 million. Um, RDOF, you know, the FCC went to the states and said, you know, we need you guys to all step up. Now here's RDOF going, well, actually, no, if you if you've received state funding, because states are doing amazing work, if you've received state funding, you're no longer eligible for RDOF. It, it shouldn't be one or the other. Um, we need an we need an all hands on deck approach to solving the digital divide of um, access and accessibility in rural America. Um, and I just don't understand why the FCC uh, would again, like I said, take the legs out from under states at this crucial moment for funding. Right. Well, good. well, we'll talk more about this in our discussion that we'll get to just now. Let's let's turn it over to uh, Brian O'Hara to tell us a little bit about uh, Enrica's role in the broadband space, including including RDOF, and uh, it, 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 speak speak again a little bit about um, uh, the vision and the and the role that these cooperatives, so important a part of their community, uh, are playing uh, in this space. Well, well thank you, Drew. Um, and I found myself in the last two speakers just shaking my head a lot because yeah, I agree with a lot was said. So uh, let me first give a step back and talk a little bit about, you know, generally about electric co-ops. Uh, there are about 900 nationwide. We serve 56% of the land mass, but only about 12% of the population. So we like to say it's like a lot of dirt between those houses. So hard to reach, uh, high cost, right? Um, low population density means you have to put out more infrastructure for, uh, for a lower uh, group of people to uh, defray those costs. Um, so we have been, electric ops since their founding in the 1930s or so, uh, been integral to their communities and for the community development and economic uh, viability of those communities. Um, and electric co-ops have been increasingly seeing the important role of, uh, of broadband for their economic uh, viability of their community. So they've been getting into that. So there's also another reason why they've been getting into broadband and that is the smart grid, right? Uh, it is increasingly difficult to run a modern electric grid without robust communications backbone. So uh, most co-ops, or not most, but a lot of co-ops are already starting to deploy some fiber uh, to support their electric operations. And that does make it easier then for them to take the next step and start to deploy farther out to, to also provide broadband. And you know, we have a, a saying within the building at NRECA that um, uh, you met one co-op, you met one co-op, right? So they're all a little different. The community's a little different. They're all, you know, they're self-governed by their members. So they all think a little differently. So it's not a monolith. Um, so we like to think that uh, we want flexibility uh, in all the models. And, and you see such a broad range of what these co-ops are doing when you talk to them. Uh, the different levels of partnerships that are going on, um, 
or even just the different ways that many of these uh, co-ops are going about it, uh, deploying broadband on their own. So a, a lot of different unique stories going on. Um, but uh, let me quickly go back and talk about CAF2, right? That was really, I think- one And of the, the Connect America Fund, just to unpack the acronym. Thank you, the Connect America Fund, the reverse auction there in 2018. That was kind of the FCC's first real foray into expanding access to this universal service, the high cost portion beyond the uh, traditional local providers, right? The incumbent telcos. Um, so that was only about a $2 billion program, $2 billion total. They uh, ended up putting out, I think, 1.48. Um, electric co-ops, first time that they were eligible, they ended up uh, walking away with, I think, 30% of all the winning bids, right? So I think there was about 100 or so, 105 total winners, and we were about 35 uh, winners. So about 30% of all the winners were electric co-ops. So we were happy with that. Uh, the vast majority are deploying fiber, although I will say that we have a, a significant minority that are using fixed wireless. Uh, and that's been used for years, not just to deploy broadband, but also to support electric operations. So uh, we're, we're no stranger to fixed wireless. And uh, if I can quickly go to some of the concerns that are brought up that Professor Ali hit on with the art off, I mean, we do have some major concerns with some of these winners and uh, what they propose to do, right? And so uh, NRECA working with NRTC filed a white paper with the um, FCC recently expressing some of our concerns with the, uh, the not only technological ability of some of these fixed wireless to provide gigabit service, but the financial viability of such a plan. So um, NRTC has helped build not just fiber networks for electric ops, but also for fixed wireless. So they had uh, done an area where they um, had mapped out what it would take to bring 100 megabits by fixed wireless. And they found that probably need four towers in that given area. And then they said, okay, after this auction, they said, well, let's run, run through the software and look what it would take to do uh, the same area, but with gigabit with fixed wireless. And the difference was immense, right? So you go from four towers to reach 100 megs for that whole area to 37 towers to try and bring a gigabit to all those areas. Um, and, you know, that is not cheap. It's not easy to get cited. It takes a long time. So in addition to the technological hurdles, uh, there's going to be a lot of financial hurdles and citing hurdles and, and other things. So uh, we are concerned. We are also we're concerned, uh, but a little less or so with um, uh, the low Earth orbit Starlink, because um, it is in beta testing. You know, that may pan out, it may work out, but uh, we have concerns. And, you know, my thinking before this happened was, you know, in round two, they're going to be a big player in phase two. But uh, but no, here they came in early when they were still in beta test and won a lot of money. So we have some concerns there. Um, some other examples I want to bring up of things that are going on, um, which I think are fascinating, is um, it's not just electric co-ops that are doing this, even though we are leading the way in the electric utility space. Increasingly, the investor-owned utilities are getting involved, you know, usually not to the end user or retail service, but they're providing middle mile. And I'll give a good example from Virginia. Um, so Dominion Energy, right, the largest IOU in the state, uh, was required by state legislation to do a feasibility study on broadband, and they did. Um, and they figured out what it would cost to deploy broadband and what role they could play. Uh, and they put out an RFP, and they asked for anyone who wanted to come and lease out their network, uh, which is mainly, you know, would be the backbone um, to any provider, right? To get broadband out to some unserved areas in their electric service territory. Well, not a single incumbent telco approached them or responded to the RFP, but three electric co-ops did. So uh, they are gonna be leasing, you know, the middle mile and the feeders away from, uh, into a neighborhood, if you will, from Dominion. And then the electric co-ops will be the ISP and they will run fiber to the home. And the three electric co-ops that, that have jumped onto that are, are, are Bark, uh, Prince George, and Northern Neck. So I think this provides a good model too. So like I said, there's many different models out there and this is just another one. Um, but it also shows the power that uh, can be leveraged with other uh, utility players such as the, uh, the large investor owned. So um, there's a lot of good stories out there. And you know, increasingly, we even see a couple of our co-ops that are partnering with some of the um, somewhat larger uh, ILEX, right? I've seen a couple members, or one members partnering with uh, Cincinnati Bell, right? So a mid-sized ILEC, that, that didn't usually happen. I think there's discussions with Windstream and a couple of my members as well. So um, you're seeing, uh, I think, a lot of different models 
going on out there. But to, to go to another point that was brought up that I'll wrap up on, and I'm very much looking forward to some discussion, is, you know, Professor Arley hit on how uh, some of the state funds can be handicapped um, by the RDOF. Well, it's, I think in some ways it's kind of going the other way as well, right? So, so now we have some concerns with some of the folks that were initially awarded RDOF funding. Well, now those areas are totally off the table, right? For other federal funding, the, the two billion in stimulus that just popped up and the two billion that's on the table at all the different states, right? So, um, I mean, a state can make up its own mind of where to put that money, but it's gonna be hard to have that fight in, in the state if federal money is going there, right? It's less likely to go, but it definitely takes the federal funding off the table, right? And here's our concern. So let's just say one of these more questionable bidders in RDOF, um, you know, got the initial win, now we're through the evaluation period. Really, all they want in the auction was the ability to prove that they can do what they're supposed to do in this long form evaluation. I think it would be the worst of both worlds if it now takes the FCC eight months to a year to look at these and then say, nope, these guys aren't qualified and they've missed out on other funding, whether it be through the stimulus programs or be through some other state programs that they could have taken advantage of. So, you know, we have some major concerns with that. Um, we don't want those areas to be automatically deemed off uh, off limits. And also, you know, let's be honest, there's been some funds earlier that went out uh, to deploy um, less than 25-3. So should those be off the table, right? Do we want to leave those communities behind at the 10-1, 4-1, whatever they got funding for before? You know, that's something I think that also needs to be considered. So um, I'll leave it at that. And I look forward to some robust uh, conversation. Well, well, great, and and thank you very much for um, that 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 good summary of 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 uh, Enrica. It prompts so many questions. Let me just kind of lead right into it to, to you, Brian. Um, the first is you you did use one acronym there for IOUs, the investor-owned utilities, right? And so obviously, what what you're discussing is the 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 world of electricity. Um, you know, generation and consumption uh, is is in you know two big buckets: the investor-owned utilities that serve the, the the more populated areas, and the rural electric co-ops that serve the less populated areas. Correct. And Thank there's you. not an exact analogy for the telecom space. Indeed, this is what makes to me telecom so fascinating: is that there's all kinds of technologies, there's all kinds of players, there's all kinds of business models, including evolving business models. Could you just speak though a little bit about what about your kind of um, analog on the telecom side, the, the telecommunications co-ops as opposed to the electric co-ops. Could you just speak a little bit about that? How are relations between the electric co-ops and the telecommunications co-ops? Um, and, and particularly as we're talking about now advanced technologies, fiber and deployments of fiber, Brian. Yeah, no, that's a great question and something I should hit on, yes. Yeah, so um, you're right that there's a lot of electric co-ops and their uh, service territory a lot of times overlaps with small independent telcos, including telephone co-ops. Um, so they do work together when they serve the same areas a lot of times. I'll say originally and still to today, the vast majority of times that uh, you see a partnership, an electric co-op going into a partnership um, with a telco, it's with a small independent provider, whether it be a small commercially owned or a, a small um, telephone co-op. So uh, you see a lot of those happening um, most often when there is a partnership. Um, you know, as far as that relationship between electric co-ops and telephone co-ops, it, it can be a little hit or miss. Uh, it's kind of interesting sometimes how in a lot of areas they get along great and it's, uh, you know, hand in glove. Some other areas and, you know, it's maybe somewhat parochial or, or rooted in something in the past where they, they may not get along as well or, or not as, I'll say probably not partner or work as closely together as they do in other areas. But um, I said that is not to diminish the fact that the vast majority of times that uh, my members are doing partnerships, it's with those small local providers. And what they share is, you know, that, that concern for community, the cooperative principles, number seven of the cooperative principles that telephone co-ops and electric co-ops share is concern for community. So uh, they, they do share that, that common uh, thread of, uh, of, of that concern for community. Well, so another theme that we've all three of us, uh, four of us here talked about is, is sort of the evolution of technology. Mark talked about kind of the move from DSL 
to fixed wireless, to, to fiber. Uh, and it's clear now that, that, that technologies, even those that are wireless, fixed wireless, will have to rely on fiber deep into the neighborhoods, into access points, into towers. And, and so that is kind of, it's, it's not a controversial statement anymore to say we need to get fiber further, faster. And so for that, and I want everyone's perspective on this, what are the, are the best ways to advance the deployment of fiber? Is it, is it going to be through um, you know, co cooperatives, collaborations, partnerships? Um, uh, how, how do each of you view the, the marketplace, so to speak, for backhaul and how much of an impediment that is? to getting advanced uh, broadband to the rural areas. And I, I just, again, love everyone's thoughts on this, this topic or a, a take on this topic. I'll just quickly start and just say that um, that goes directly to what Professor Ali brought up with that lawsuit. Um, you know, I, I would like to think that a lot of the uh, electrics could play a good role, right? In, in running the fiber out, at least a backbone. Um, and the interesting thing about the lawsuit that uh, Professor Ali brought up in Virginia is Virginia had changed, changed its laws within the last few years, and I think about 18, 19 states have, that basically give electric utilities um, the right to deploy broadband over that same easement. Uh, however, now it is being challenged, right? And this will set a precedent going forward. Um, you know, potentially other states, like other landowners may get this idea too, if they can get some windfall of money or something can happen. So uh, I think that is going to be a, a big, um, kind of pivot point to see what happens with that. I'll also say that when the states that have been updating their laws to, uh, to address these easement issues, oftentimes a lot of the cable industry has supported that because they have been able to tag on some other things for their own easement issues, which might've been only tied to video back in the day or be outdated as well. So it's not just for, for electric utilities, this can, this can go more broadly. Yeah, I'd have to, uh, also say, I mean, I think Drew, you said it right with just the word partnerships. I mean, this is not going, this, you know, solving the rural urban digital divide is not going to be solved by one type of broadband provider, one company. Uh, certainly won't be solved by the national providers as we tried in the first CAF too. Um, it's going to take partnerships. My, my favorite story of partnerships is something I read about in my book, which is a partnership between Rock County, Minnesota, which is in the southwest pocket of the state um, and uh, Telephone Cooperative Alliance Communications out of South Dakota. They used state, uh, state grant and they worked together. Uh, and uh, Rock County is now one of the most connected counties in the state of Minnesota with fiber to the home, which is fantastic. So I think there, there's so many opportunities um, for partnerships out there. Um, the other thing that uh, I think we could, we could talk about is dialing down some of the hype around Leo and 5G. Um, reminding us that, uh, and this is a quote I love, Deb Sosha told me this from Next Century Cities when she was there now at Chattanooga, wireless is just one wire less, right? It's just that last mile is wireless. It all needs this fiber optic backhaul. But I think sometimes in, in, the, in the commercial hype around the possibilities of millimeter wave 5G um, and more, more recently of Leo that we've kind of forgotten that whole backhaul, com backhaul component. None of this is possible without a fiber optic backhaul, fiber optic middle mile. Um, and, you know, and ideally last mile as much as we can get to. So I think that combination of, of partnerships, kind of like I said, all hands on deck, uh, like Brian said, electric cooperatives, telephone cooperatives, um, broadband cooperatives, and, 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 uh, and other providers, um, and states and other organizations, uh, and then dialing down some of the hype around some of these new um, uh, technologies that are largely still in beta, maybe that combination can help uh, a larger nationwide fiber rollout as well. No, I, I agree with what's been said. I think that, uh, you know, when you look at um, what needs to be done, it's going to be a combination of a lot of different approaches in different areas, because as, uh, as Brian said, you, know, you meet one cooperative, you met one cooperative. I think that's the same, the same case with rural broadband. Um, different approaches and different solutions. Uh, you will require public-private partnerships um, the missing link in this is money. And so that's where, um, you know, the federal government is stepping up through the various uh, programs that are out there. They are throwing a lot of money at this issue, and that's going to need to be out there to, to, to make this work. But, you know, 5G, um, there's, there's been a lot of hype about it, yes, and there's a lot of discussion as to what really is 5G. But the fact that you're going to need 
fiber to make whatever you want to define it as you need fiber to make it work. And that is going to help push the fiber into the more rural areas. And, and the other point I want to, you know, th this is not really relevant to the fiber discussion, but we, we um, Brian talked a lot about, you know, the, the, the cooperative model. And I just want to point out that um, the business case is very different with the cooperative because they are not looking at uh, a, a three-year return on investment that a private company has to follow from Wall Street. A cooperative is owner uh, owned and invested in the community and they have a 20 year horizon to, 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 to turn things around. And so it, 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 you can't compare the two because they're, they're not the same business model. So, uh, but, but got to get that fiber out there into the, into the really th throughout the entire country to make not just 5g work, but to get the bandwidth that you need and no one's brought it up yet, but, you know, COVID has only highlighted the dire need to get this problem solved. Now, I'm getting a lot of questions, maybe personal uh, questions from one of the participants in our discussion today. And I think it's, it's useful to kind of press, press a little bit on this point. Now, obviously, we, we all agree, no controversy here, that you need fiber in the network. But if we're talking about the last mile, the that last access piece of it, um, it sh shall we rule out uh, wireless, fixed wireless, because it does not have the same beta issues that have been highlighted about uh, satellite technology, and which is featured in a story on the lead of Broadband Breakfast right now, I might point out. Whereas, uh, again, fixed wireless has been alive and kicking for many years, gotten quite a lot of strength, and, and they, they, they do have a very high speed. So I guess could maybe those of you offer your thoughts and Brian, maybe you start on this one too, because you did mention some of your co-ops do do fixed wireless. So what are some of the calculations they go through on fixed wireless versus fiber as a last mile connection? Yeah, uh, yeah thank you, Drew, and you're 100% right. I have a lot of members that are using fixed wireless for the last mile. Um, where the question comes from my members uh, and from NRECA is, can it provide gigabit, right? And especially in a rural area. Um, and it has really, in, in our mind, uh, hasn't been proven. 100 megs, yeah, uh, that's being done. And I think in the previous Connect America Fund auction, we thought the FCC made the right choice that said, fixed wireless, yes, you can bid, but you can't bid in the gigabit tier. And the fixed wireless did very well at the 100 slash 20 tier, right? They won a lot of money. And that's not a bad speed, right? Uh, that can handle most applications. And I think most people will be very, had, very glad to have that. Um, we are concerned once again, though, and it is a proven technology, but it's not proven to provide gigabit level speed, especially in rural areas where you could have the tough terrain, the foliage, right? So the high bandwidth spectrum doesn't have the distance or the, uh, you know, won't penetrate trees or other foliage or other issues, um, right? Or you have the lower band spectrum, which travels the distance, but doesn't have the throughput, right? So making that happen in rural America we see as difficult and we think it's a great tool in the toolbox, but don't know about the gigabit level service. All right, if, if either you wanna chime in, please, please do, or we can go on to more questions here. Um, in fact, one question I'd love to ask, building off of Mark's uh, initial points is how important, and we, this is one of the topics we really do wanna address, which is to say, how do these things make a difference in the lives of rural residents, right? How do we make sure that the fiber or the fixed wireless or whatever technology it is that's delivering better broadband, how do we make sure that translates into, you know, applications, usage, um, uh, digital engagement, um, uh, more equitable ability for people to access the internet? I, I, again, I'd love, Mark and Chris, your thoughts on this, as well as Brian's about how these make a difference in their rural communities? Well, I, I think the big thing right now is education because as, as, as kids could no longer go in person to school and they, they needed to do remote learning and then as folks could no longer, I, I'm working out of my house still and by the background, I, it looks like uh, Chris is working out of his house and, and Drew, it looks like you're out of yours. Ryan, I'm not sure if he's got the, the background there, but he might still be working out of his house, but you have work at home, you have remote learning. So 
the need for the broadband is, is paramount. And you look at it and what does broadband do? It does, it does education, it does business development, it does health, it does uh, you know, entertainment, it does virtually everything. And the, the need for it, I think, you know, we're beyond why do you need broadband? It's you know, how fast of speeds can you get out there? You know, what is necessary? And, and that, quite frankly, is an evolving issue, right? Because you know, we started off at 10.1 with the FCC in terms of their definition of broadband. Then it migrated to 25.3. I think in a short period of time, it's going to migrate to something higher. We found out through what we're doing right now with a Zoom meeting with all of these people, your up speed is important now. It never used to be. It used to be your down speed. And as long as you had a little bit up, you were fine. But now we have to upload video uh, to do Zoom calls and to do conference calls and, and things of this nature. So um, the, the speed requirement goes up. So that's going to also, you know, cause the need for bandwidth to go up. And so I think, uh, you know, there's different technologies that'll do that. Um, certainly wireless works good, um, but it works better as you get it closer to the fiber because the fiber is needed for the, the back call and the middle mile facilities. Otherwise things stop working. Um, in terms of the digital inclusion, uh, Drew, you, you're right on the money there in terms of, you know, needing to get everybody on board with, with, with what, what can be done and what needs to be done. That, I think, is changing primarily because of kids in schools are getting exposed to this. And we're at the point now where you really can't get a good education if you don't have computer access and Internet access to be able to do your homework, to be able to do your your um video lectures and things of that nature. And I think that is really permeating through. Um, you always had business people, I think, that were on board with this. And then you start finding needs for older people to get online, pictures of the grandkids, um, but even the Medicare and Medicaid. You need to have those con connections right now to be able to engage in video chatting with your doctors and, and, and others. So I, I think that is all happening naturally as time goes on. Um, you know, and, and to that, I would add um, that uh, when we speak of education, uh, a, a recent study by, by Keith Hampton found that broadband se alone separates a, a, at least half a grade point uh, between those students who have broadband and those students who don't have broadband, right? So there's, a, there's kind of that immediate material thing. Also, the National Bureau of Economic Research found that those with high speed broadband are more likely to social distance than those without. So it literally, the presence of broadband could be a matter of life and death. Um, I, I completely agree with Mark though, that, that when we talk, deployment is just one part of the puzzle. This is, you know, it doesn't, the existence of broadband may not do something. We have to add that digital inclusion piece. Um, broadband can also raise home values. Fiber to the home uh, raises the house's value by 3.1%. Um, but, you know, I'm also thinking, I'm mindful of like in so many of our policies um, over the last 15 years have, have uh, uh, exemplified what I call um, a politics of good enough, that it's just a matter of getting whatever out there to rule America because it just, it's something. Um, those politics really don't hold water anymore. It's not about getting something. Um, rural, rural communities, rural America uh, needs the same high performance broadband as John Salad would say. Um, as everybody else. And this is why, you know, the, the, the importance of, of fiber and, um, you know, kind of fiber fueled fixed wireless networks, um, because, because it can be a matter of life and death. And it's, it's health, it's education. Um, it's talking to grandma, you know, uh, it's all of these things that we may all take for granted for those of us who live in larger, larger centers. Um, so it's not about just getting something out there. It's about getting high performance broadband. Um, and that's what really is making uh, the difference. Let's come back to the, uh, the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund as, as probably the biggest of these uh, deployments that we've been talking about. And um, uh, to, to, to Brian first, could, could you speak a little bit about both the practical issues and questions that um, Enrica members face as they're working to qualify for and then implement but also the policy issues, okay? And so again, there were obviously rules in place for RDOF phase one that are there or not going away, but, but you have talked about sort of state issues and making sure there's not conflict. So from a policy perspective, what are some thoughts you, you might have on that? And then again, we'll open up to everyone 
both practical and policy questions to address going forward here. Well, certainly, yeah. And, you know, this goes to, you know, the concern that, um, that, uh, that, that my members had with, um, with the RDOF. First, one thing I think that kept a few of our members from getting involved was the fact that uh, in the RDOF, um, census block groups didn't usually align with electric service territory. And I think first and foremost, my members want to serve their members first. They know they have to go outside, but that was one policy consideration when they were, when they were weighing it. So now going forward, right, we, we did have a good amount of uh, co-ops that won. Uh, I think w our estimate is co-ops won about 1.6 billion uh, in the, uh, in the RDOF auction. So we're pleased with that. Obviously, it could have been higher if certain things uh, were different, especially I think some were underbid by, as we said, talked about, the, the fixed wireless. But now is the hard part, right? Now you have to build. Um, and some of the other concerns I'm hearing from folks are supply chain, getting enough contractors, trained contractors, which I know the FCC has brought up, you know, getting enough workforce um, and people that can hang fiber and, you know, tower climbers, all these things. Uh, these are all practical considerations that policy can help drive, right, uh, folks to become, get more trained fiber hangers uh, and, and tower, tower climbers, people that can do this work. Uh, it's, it's kind of problematic. And, um, you know, we will be also pushing forward in the near future, hopefully, but it'll probably take a while uh, for phase two. You know, we'd like to see that happen quickly. Obviously, the mapping has to be corrected first, um, and there's plenty of issues with that. Um, but uh, a lot of my members now are, you know, are in the, in the deployment mode or looking to see what they can do. And, and they're, you know, they're getting hit with um, uh, plenty of other the more practical issues. And of course, a lot of my members have not had to deal with some of the regulatory requirements, right? If they have not been in broadband before, this is a whole new world for them. So it is something that they need to consider. They need to get up to speed on. Luckily, there's a lot of good consultants and law firms out there that can uh, help them, uh, you know, get up to speed on that and make sure that they're in compliance. Absolutely. Lots of issues uh, to, to comply with when you become an art off because you, know, you need to be able to have eligible telecommunications carrier status, even for just the broadband piece under the, the art off auction. So, so very important to highlight that piece that uh, maybe people just in the broadband business haven't been focused on previously. Chris and Mark, what are some of your thoughts on the, the practical and the policy questions that, that Brian has just been speaking about. Chris, go ahead and I'll uh, pick up later. Yeah, uh, I, I'm not sure what more um, what more to add. I okay. think Brian covered uh, covered most of it. Um, you know, the one the one thing that we haven't really spoken about for for rural broadband in terms of policy is also the role that USDA plays. Um, uh, particularly the reconnect program, but also the telecommunications program. Um, in a lot of my research, I've heard that one of the more um, time consuming resource intensive things is trying to apply for a USDA loan or grant. Um, I think USDA could go a long way in simplifying and streamlining their application process. Um, because I've talked to a number of providers, um, co-ops, small, you know, uh, uh, small telecommunications companies, be they're co-op or not, who say, we'd love to apply for this money because it fits our needs, but we can't either A, afford to hire a lawyer to do it for us, or B, devote an entire staff member to putting, you know, uh, putting an application together and then following through with some of the regulatory requirements of a USDA reconnect loan or grant or loan grant combination. So I think, you know, at the policy level, we can make it a whole lot easier for those who want to tap into some of this money to actually do so. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think USDA could, it could really go a long way in improving these applications. So there, the federal, different federal agencies have different rules and regulations that they need to follow. Um, one of ours is that our grants can only go to nonprofit and public entity. So we could not give a grant to an AT&T or a Verizon uh, or a Windstream or a CenturyLink or Frontier um, to do anything with really because they cannot get the grant directly. We're, we're, we, they have to be a public entity or, um, or a nonprofit. Um, now, what, with what the FCC could do through the RDOF and USDA through the ReConnect, um, they can fund uh, uh, private companies. So there are differences with all these different federal agencies. And there is an effort underway right now. There, you know, we, we, we meet, there's a group called 
the American Broadband Initiative. Um, it's made up of representatives of all the federal agencies. And I could tell you we meet frequently because I'm on it. And uh, every, every other week we have a call um, to all, all the federal agencies together to talk about all kinds of policy things to try to come up with solutions. And there is definitely an awareness that you know, some of these uh, programs uh, are difficult to apply for. And there's uh, efforts underway really to uniform that process across all federal agencies. And you may get to the point where there's one broadband application, regardless of which agency you're actually going to be doing the application for. So, um, you know, there, there are efforts being made there. It's difficult only because each agency has its own rules and regulations that they, that they need to follow. So, you know, is the RDOF the answer? Um, in a lot of cases it is, and in some cases it might not be, but, you know, it, it, it's a step in the right direction. Um, it's phase one. They're only supposed to be going to areas that have no broadband. They're not, they're not filling in gaps where there is some broadband in what we would call the unserved areas. So it, it's a step in the right direction to try to hit totally unserved areas. And there is a concern. There is a you know, we do not want to have one federal agency spend money doing an area and have another federal agency to spend money covering with a different provider for the same area, because the, the overlap is an issue. And, you know, that's why you have these rules and regulations about saying, but if the state's going to put money in there, then the, then the RDOF wouldn't want to, or if the RDOF does, then the state shouldn't be overlaying the same area, because the intent is to try to get unserved areas covered at least in the phase one of the RDOF. And then in phase two, when the maps are better and they're, they're more accurate and they're no longer census block, census tract based, then you get a better feel for how to fill in the gaps. And, and that will come in phase two. Um, I'm not sure when that's going to be, but that will come in phase two for the RDOF. And they actually are gonna have more money in phase two than they had in phase one. And in phase one, they had 9.2 billion dollars right right uh they they definitely spent less than they were planning to anticipate it but mark just to push back a little bit i think one of the problems here is that when you're using a, 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 an outdated benchmark like 25 megabits down and three megabits up as served then then i think it's quite reasonable to provide another competitor for that because we want to have better quality broadband. And, and again, I think that it is to the FCC's credit that most of the approved applications are for delivering either gigabit or 100 megabit speeds. But again, the, the proof will be whether that can be achieved. Um, I, I don't wanna let go of this issue of digital inclusion and connection and how we get, um, and, and I, I'm gonna again, turn to, to you, Brian, on the co-op angle because you're kind of right in the communities. And let's, let's speak about how, um, either co-ops or other players can play a role in the digital inclusion, in the outreach, in the making sure that um, uh, broadband builds are, are successful um, through making sure people understand what's coming their way and how it might be different from what they've had. So, um, Brian, what, what do, how do you all think of the issue of digital inclusion? True, couldn't agree more that it's important, right? I mean, it, you have the field of dreams problem, right? You just can't build it and expect they'll come, right? They need to know how to use it, be able to afford a device, be able to afford the service, right? I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things that happen here. So uh, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, so uh, let me give you, start off with a good example from one of our members up in Pennsylvania, uh, Trico Connections. They were a CAF2 winner and uh, an RDOF winner, um, electric co-op that's been deploying broadband. And they, um, they started what they call a seniors to seniors program, right? So High school which, which we featured on Broadband Breakfast. You can read That's about right. the seniors. You did. Program. It's a great program, right? So the high school seniors help uh, provide digital literacy training to uh, to senior citizens. And, uh, you know, digital literacy, you know, something I think a lot of us take for granted, right? That we, we use computers every day. We think the vast majority of people have this access and know how to use them, but that's not necessarily the case. And I think I saw someone putting something in the chat about libraries and libraries can play a very important role, right? For your early access, because so they will have computers there and for training for classes or a lot of the Community Connect program at USDA also, you know, can, can play a role there. You need to educate the folks about it. But also another thing that I think is very important for digital inclusion is affordability, right? So electric co-ops serve 93% 
of persistent poverty counties in the US, right? So that is, that shows an income problem, right? And once again, if you build something and it's 150 bucks a month, that's pretty much the same as them not having access in the first place, right? And I think that goes to how outdated our Lifeline program is that the 925 discount, right? So uh, I was very glad to see that Congress put forth that emergency broadband connectivity program to provide the $50 or $75 on the uh, tribal lands areas, right? Because that's, I think, will also go a long way. I can't remember if they had a, a, a amount for devices, but I think devices, right, that, that can throw a lot of people out of reach of this. Um, so, you know, I know some members that are working with community to collect old computers, rehab them and, and help give them back out uh, and do a lot of community outreach. Um, but there's more that can be done there. And that's a harder nut to crack in my mind. You know, how I go into your neighborhood and teach you the benefits of this, if, if you don't know it or don't know how to work a computer, this, that's a tough thing to do. And, and maybe Christopher or Mark have uh, some ideas there. Go ahead, well, I, Chris. Oh, I was just gonna say, you know, one of the things um, I, I absolutely agree about the, you know, if they build it, they will come scenario. I mean, that's just not the case, you know, but we, we need to add the digital inclusion aspect. And this is a great, a uh, place for, for philanthropic groups to also step into as well. Um, you know, I'm thinking particularly of the Blandin Foundation in Minnesota, which does its, its uh, uh, you know, digital champion communities program and, and their funding library initiatives and, 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 and training initiatives and, and things like that. So, you know, my call here is as we're thinking about inclusion, um, philanthropic groups that are really interested in this could also um, step up um, and, and fill in some of these blanks that sometimes gets missing when we focus too much on deployment um, and not enough on the other side of, of deployment, which is inclusion. I think when you talk um, digital inclusion, the biggest factor is affordability. And if you, you know, look at Appalachia is not a, a rich, uh, affluent area of the country and you could have the access out there, but if it's not affordable, then it might as well not be there. And so, you know, we have a lot of organizations right now, uh, you know, Angela with the uh, National Digital Inclusion Alliance and what um, uh, John, John's doing with the Shelby Coalition. So you, you have a lot out there that's, that's handling the, you know, digital inclusion from a what and why perspective the affordability is, is a key, key constraint when you're talking about why people are not getting on their computers and if they have computers, why they're not getting on them and, 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 and linking into uh, an internet provider. Well, we're, we're coming close to our time. I wanna give each of our panelists a chance to offer some, some brief closing thoughts. I, I wanna kind of come back to the, the, some of the points that we made earlier about the reason that uh, a group of electrical co-ops has gotten so involved is because they, they haven't, and I'm, maybe I'm speaking for you a little bit, Brian, but they haven't seen the kind of progress they, they wanted from other players already. And, and because of that, we're seeing new opportunities for new construction, uh, for, for going after um, what, what uh, hasn't been there, i.e. fiber building closer into the neighborhoods, if not to the home. And I would, again, invite this conversation will continue beyond this, this session, of course. But any final thoughts that Brian, you first, and then Chris, and then we'll close with you, Mark, about um, what you see as ways to make sure we get the kinds of connectivity we need for rural communities. Brian. Yeah. Thank you, Drew, and thanks for the invite to be here. I agree uh, that we can't be thinking of that minimum 25-3. I think it's been touched upon here. You know, a lot of things, a lot of applications now, as was brought up by multiple people, education, the upload speeds, we need to be aiming higher, right? Um, and, and then truthfully, our belief is that fiber is the way to go. Uh, fiber may be more expensive to deploy in, in, the, sh in, in the short term, but also I've been told that, uh, you know, over a long period of time, it's, it's, it actually saves more money compared to say fixed wireless where technology may change quicker. But, um, you know, you need to get this out there. Uh, you hit on it, Drew, that the main reason my members are, are getting into this business is because no one else would come and serve their communities, right? They basically, the community came to them and said, no one else is fixing this problem. You come and help us. So we need to get this out there. We need to aim high. If we keep aiming for the bottom, then we're gonna be just throwing money out the door again and again to these same areas. And I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Brian. Chris, that's really... 
Yeah, well, um, two things I'll, I'll, I'll quickly mention as we close up. Um, one is uh, I'm increasingly re realizing and thinking about the important role that counties play um, in, in broadband deployment. And we're actually seeing uh, here in Virginia, some counties step up and almost act, you know, at, at, or create their own broadband networks. Again, in the absence of providers, when they can't find a dance partner in that public-private partnership, we're seeing counties actually uh, fund their own networks. And I think that's something exciting to be watching. The other thing I'm going to be on the lookout for in 2021 is possibly the reintroduction of the Accessible Affordable Internet for All Act um, uh, uh, with uh, James Clyburn's act uh, that proposes $100 billion, 80 for deployment, 20 for... Um, inclusion efforts. And, you know, maybe a couple of years ago, 100 billion seemed like a lot of money. But when we're passing trillion dollar stimulus packages, you know, now is a now is an opportunity, a great opportunity to kind of build on this um, and, and plug this kind of infrastructure hole um, as we're looking to uh, roll out more stimulus packages um, in the wake of COVID. Thanks for that reminder. Mark, the last word. Well, Drew, I think I'm going to try to end this on a positive note. We, we have a long, long way to go. But let's also look at how far we've come. I know when I started traveling Appalachia, um, I had a laptop computer and a long telephone cord, and I had to plug it into the telephone and do dial up. And now, no matter where I go, no matter what hotel I go to, there's wireless broadband, might not be the highest speeds in the world, but there's wireless broadband. And most schools have something and the libraries have something. We've made a hell of a lot of progress. Yes, we have a long way to go, but let's also recognize that we've come pretty far too. Well, wonderful words to end by. Before we thank our guests, I do want to thank our sponsors, Render Networks uh, and their digital network construction tool and AdTran, which remembers to remember rural in the deployment of broadband. I want to remind you that next week on February 24th, we'll be discussing um, antitrust, social media and the consumer welfare standard. We hope you'll join us for that. And then on March the 3rd, we'll be talking about some of the three essential tools that every broadband network needs as they deploy uh, broadband uh, networks. Um, and in conclusion, before, um, uh, thanking our guests. We want to let you know that we're also open to more suggestions and ideas uh, about future topics. So feel free to reach out to us at Broadband Breakfast. Uh, I'm Drew Clark. And on behalf of Broadband Breakfast, I want to thank Christopher Ali, Mark DeFalco, and Brian O'Hara for being with us today for this episode of Broadband Breakfast Live Online. Thanks and see you next.